close the chat. All right, it's all up to you guys now for these two slides. <laughs> <laughs> all righty, well, we are, she jumps. We believe in the transformation of outdoor play. It's all about creating spaces that empower the community and the women and the kiddos. So increasing the participation of women and girls in the outdoors, everything from fly fishing to ski mountaineering, all the activities in the outside, we're all about it and connecting those to it. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're good, you're good. <laughs> we love exploring the vision to unearth the potential of all women and girls through outdoor play and connection to nature. Again, we increase the, particip the participation of women and girls in outdoor activities. Fly fishing is one of those activities we've been doing for years and are really looking forward to this full push this coming season with everything from intro all the way up to our river finishing schools. More information on those later. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Are you record? Oh, you are recording. Cool. We are recording. Awesome. Well, uh, welcome. This is the intro and also like fly fishing 101 class. Um, I'm Heather Hodson and I'll go in a little bit more about that, but a little housekeeping, you guys, I think with the webinar, you're probably already all turned off muted. Um, one good thing though, is I ha do have a couple videos uh, that will be connected to the internet. So if you need to um, close all of your programs out, just make sure you have uh, your, the Zoom is kind of the only thing that's open. Um, and please utilize the chat. So do know that this is a ton of information. Uh, this is where you kind of just start to dabble or just kind of begin. This is the first step in your journey of fly fishing. And uh, so know that you're not gonna probably remember it all and you're probably gonna have a lot of questions. So please feel free to use the chat. And we have uh, three moderators that will be helping with the chat. Um, so hopefully to answer your questions and then we'll turn it over at the end for a live Q&A and so then you can further get those questions answered. Um, again, my name is Heather Hodson. I go by the pronoun she, her, hers. I live in Spokane, Washington, which is right on the Idaho border, kind of close to Canada, like 70 miles from Montana, basically. I live in an absolutely amazing place. Um, I'm Northwest Fly Girl on Instagram. And uh, you can also connect with me via email at info at unitedwellnoughfly.com. So I have, uh, well, pre-COVID, usually about 130 maybe plus days out on the water. Um, I am actually a critical care nurse by trade. So some of this information, kind of the first stuff we talk about is really where the uh, heart of a fish or the fish's heart is. Um, I like to really include a lot of anatomy into um, some of these classes. So you guys will be hearing some of that. And um, I started a women's group called United Women on the Fly. And I'll talk more about that here in a sec. So one of my main moderators um, who's been with United Women on the Fly for a very long time is Sue. And I don't think that she'll be able to, um, to talk, but I can just reintroduce her. Um, she's Sue, she lives in uh, Maine and she's Maine Fly Gal on Instagram. And she goes also by the pronouns she, her, hers. She's a certified casting instructor, has a wealth of knowledge. And um, she is going to be the one, like, especially if you have any technical questions, um, she will uh, be able to answer those. And kind of the first, this is the first step in this uh, kind of river development area, right? So we're all trying to, or um, collaborating with She Jumps and with United Women Will Fly and trying to just um, grow new anglers and help build this amazing community. So um, there's the river development school. So you guys are kind of the first online class and then there's gonna be a river development school in June. We have, um, hopefully some of you guys are registered for the event in August. And then there's still some space in the kind of final graduation portion in October. So you'll get more of that information um, in the follow-up email, but um, please, I just know that this is kind of the beginning of your journey and it's only gonna get better from here on out. Um, I am working with Whitney and with also Hillary. So they're the ones that are actually kind of working on all of the curriculum. Um, so it's pretty cool. I know them, I've known them personally for a really long time and it's really awesome just to now work with them professionally as well. Um, so uh, really cool that, you know, this kind of collaboration. So speaking of United Women on the Fly, again, this is a, a, 
uh, community, just a big organization that I founded almost five years ago. And uh, we really focus on connection, education, and resources. So our mission statement, you know, I was pretty excited to team up with She Jumps just because um, you know, we're trying to really collaborate with other like mind missions um, within different organizations. So our mission is uh, United on the Fly is committed to building an inclusive community that educates, provides resources, encourages and connects anglers, mostly women from all backgrounds into the sport of fly fishing. We will uh, advocate for equitable access opportunities and representation for all women. United Women on the Fly acknowledges that our events and photos shared take place on traditional unceded indigenous lands. And again, you know, our objectives are uh, connection and also education and resources. To find out more, you can just uh, go on to United or, or look us up on social media and you'll, you'll find us all over the place. And this, feel free to take a screenshot if you want. This is just ways for you to be able to connect with us. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, you're probably going to have several questions. Maybe you forgot to ask a question, or um, feel free to just direct message us and/or to um, send us an email, and we can help with that information or those help answer those questions. All right, let's get into this. So. Um, first and foremost, I really think that as we start to talk about fly fishing, um, we kind of, you know, there's catch and release and there's, there's also um, keeping your fish. So, you know, many fly anglers do practice catch and release. And the one thing I'll say with that is if you do practice catch and release, it's best to know kind of those principles and tips, um, which will cause the least amount of harm to these fish. Um, and, you know, so United on the Fly is actually a, a media partner with Keep Fish Wet. So they're an organization that does a lot of science-based research. And so it's a great place to go to get more tips and more education. Um, again, this is, uh, it's Keep Fish Wet. They use that hashtag. And, you know, one thing too, uh, photographing fish underwater looks pretty cool. So you can get some really great photos with that. And eat local. So United Women on the Fly does support the legal harvest of fish. So, you know, I think sometimes with fly fishing, um, you know, there's a lot of perceptions that we're only catch and release, and that's not necessarily the case. So again, if it's legal and uh, you're gonna, you know, go for it, and then if, as long as it's legal. Um, now, being a heart nurse, I really wanna talk about uh, the fish um, anatomy and physiology, and especially like where the fish's heart is. So first and foremost, it's important because as a new angler, this is something that you can definitely teach or share this knowledge to new anglers or new people, but also you're probably gonna wanna uh, get a picture of the fish that you just caught. So if you know where that fish's heart is, so the fish's heart is actually gonna be right above this fin right here. And um, most new anglers kind of squeeze that heart and a lot of times then the fish is flopping and it might flop out of your hands or it's really, you know, it's kind of stressed. So what I like to teach is, um, so here's our fish. We all know the AOK -okay sign. So you can actually do an AOK -okay sign and you can go on, along the fish's uh, tail. And then you just gently cup that fish and kind of support it. And I promise you that fish will be calm. So again, it's good to know as a new angler because you're gonna want some photos. So, you know, the more calm you are and the, the better you know how to handle a fish, um, the better. And this is one thing that you guys can share with uh, somebody new. Um, we also, United Women on the Fly does a fish handling Friday. So you can check out, you can follow that hashtag or just watch um, for our posts. So we do a lot of science-based um, education on that as well. Um, and you get to see some really cool photos. And know your regulations. So as a new angler, um, you know, you may not even know that you need a fishing license or you may not know what the specific regulations are for a specific piece of water that you're fishing. So I live in Spokane, Washington, and in Washington state, it's actually illegal to physically take a wild steelhead out of the water. Um, so, you know, depending on whatever water that you go and fish, um, you want to just look up those regulations. And in order to find those regulations, you can go online to the local either country and or to the state. Uh, just look up like fish regulations, fishing regulations, just Google it and or where you buy your fly fish or your license. Um, most places actually have a pamphlet or like a, a book that would have all of those regulations. 
and just enjoy that journey. You know, fish don't live in ugly places. I saw that somebody was here um, joining from Los Angeles and the LA River, if you, it's one of my most favorite places to fish, it's beautiful. And I think that, you know, just stopping, looking up, looking around, you know, realizing just how privileged we are to actually be able to go out and explore these amazing places, we're pretty lucky. So just, you know, kind of just soak it all in. So why fly fishing? Well, first and foremost, fly fishing is fun. Um, it's family friendly. So you can bring your kiddos with you. Um, the one thing I would suggest is bring snacks, uh, make sure everybody's warm, as well as make sure that you're maybe fishing some water that might've been a pond or a stocked water. So that way maybe those fish are a little more eager um, and not as selective or not as smart per se. Um, so that way they can eat your flies. You can get super nerdy. So um, you can nerd out on bugs, you can nerd out on the physics of a fly rod. You can, um, you can definitely dive in and uh, kind of spend years and years just learning. And challenging. So this is a tiger muskie. This, um, what's in its mouth is a fly and that fly is literally like this big. So there are times that it can be super challenging, right? Trying to cast this big, huge fly or you have a really, um, well-educated fish that uh, got a PhD and it just flips you the fin, you know, so it's all, it can definitely be challenging, but fun and rewarding once you catch that really challenging fish. And again, fish don't live in ugly places. Soak it in, just take a look. If you're starting to get frustrated, you're getting knots or your cast just isn't right, just sit down and just, you know, look around. So we have a lot to cover tonight. And as mentioned, um, we're gonna do a Q&A at the end. We can, we'll, um, I'll unshare my screen, but um, do know too that I will be sending um, everyone the links to all this, the links within the presentation. So you don't have to be frantically writing anything down, just sit, relax, just kind of soak it all in. So first and foremost, what is fly fishing? So fly fishing, the angler casts the line, not the bait, right? Or uh, the lure. Um, so in fly casting or fly fishing, the fly line casts the fly versus the weighted lure or bait carrying the line. So when we're fly fishing, we are actually imitating what those fish are actually eating, whether it's a, some sort of an insect, either underwater or up above water and or could be some sort of bait fish, maybe a crustacean like a shrimp pattern, maybe a crab, um, something like that, leeches, you know, so we're mimicking what those fish are eating. So there's a lot of equipment. Um, I'm gonna just go through this. I do want you to know that I could literally do a presentation on fly reels, like a two hour presentation. So again, this is just that beginning of your journey. This is the intro. This is that where you're starting to dabble um, with all of this information. So um, as you continue that journey, you can dive more and more deep into um, all of this. So first we're gonna talk about fly rods and I have a fly rod here with me and I have a lot of photos. So fly rod, uh, fly rod weight. So the weight of a fly rod is going to be a number designation to the overall power or size of the fly rod. So what that means kind of as a general rule is that the smaller the fly rod weight, uh, the smaller the fish. Whereas a larger fly rod weight, the larger the fish. So you might hear like a one weight rod, a five weight rod or a 13 weight rod. So if I were to catch normal, you know, average size trout, I'd probably be using a five or a six weight fly rod. Whereas if I'm going to go Mako shark fishing in San Diego, then I'm going to be need, I'm going to need a 12 or 13 weight fly rod. So again, it's just, your weight is just a number designation for the overall power or size of that fly rod. Now I have some photos here um, that just kind of show, give some examples of different fish with different size fly rods. This is a really tiny, cute little bass. Um, so three weight fly rod. Uh, this is a shad. So this is a five weight rod. So anybody that lives in the Sacramento area, um, you can catch these and they eat flies and are lots and lots of fun. Uh, this is also a five weight fly rod. So kind of your average size trout. And, 
And let's be real, like you see all of these big, huge fish on social media. And the reality is that they're very small. Like most fish that we catch are not what you see on social media. So um, just wanted to, to point that out that most of us catch smaller fish. And then occasionally we might catch a really nice one. This is a six weight rod. And then now as our fish get bigger and bigger, this is a seven weight fly rod, an eight weight fly rod, and this is a 12 weight fly rod. So again, as those numbers go up, the size um, of fish go up as well. Now with this slide, um, I'm not gonna like read every word verbatim on here. Um, and do know that you will be getting a copy of these slides um, in the follow-up email as well. But really what I want you to get out of this on a 101 um, level is that a four to six weight rod um, is gonna be on average gonna be the best uh, rod for you if you're going to be catching medium-sized trout um, and or panfish or, or smaller bass. So really a five weight or a six weight fly rod. Now within our fly rods that we have some different pieces here. So with uh, kind of that, we call it the butt section. So you're going to have where that reel is going to actually um, insert and go into. You have your cork here, and then this is going to be kind of the thicker piece of this fly rod. So again, this is the reel seats here. You have cork, and then these pieces um, that will come together. So when they, you put them in like so. So those um, are called your ferrules. Now, when you look at your one piece, you're going to notice that there's kind of this metal kind of circular piece. Those are called your guides. So there's uh, different guides that are going to be all the way up your fly rod. Um, now, do know that these fly rods are um, tapered. So, um, you know, your butt section is going to be the fattest part of it. And then it's going to go up to the skinniest part, which is going to be your tip top. Um, again, and note that, you know, uh, this, when you're looking at this screen, it shows that it's four piece fly rod, but fly rods can come in many, many pieces. One piece, up to eight, maybe even more pieces. Uh, the most common is gonna be a four weight uh, or a four piece rod. And the reason for that is because you can travel with it. So a little travel tip is that um, if uh, you have attach your fly rod case to your backpack and it's attached, it's one piece. So if you physically are taking your fly rod in your hand, then that counts as two carry-ons. So make sure it's attached and you'll be able to have another piece, another carry-on as well. Rods also come in different lengths. So we talked about the pieces, but also the length. So, um, you know, think about if you're going to be fishing a really small little creek that may only be like seven feet across, you probably don't want to use like this rod I have in my hand in this picture um, is 13 and a half feet. So of course, I mean, that rod's going to go all the way across this small little creek. So um, on average, the average size fly rod or length is going to be nine feet. So again, five weight, uh, nine feet, zero inches is going to be kind of the most common rod for a medium sized trout. Um, and as your rivers get bigger, you might need a longer fly rod. And with certain uh, different types of fishing techniques, you might need a longer rod to mend your line. And what mending your line means is just you're moving your line either up or down um, off the rib, off the water or uh, in the air in order to get your fly to be uh, presenting itself in the most natural presentation. So there's three different types of uh, materials for different fly rods, um, graphite being the most common, um, fiberglass, and then also bamboo. So you might hear the term cane, so a cane rod. I caught that fish on a cane rod. Now, what's interesting about fly rods and what's interesting about different companies is that, of course, just to make it confusing, they like to label all of their rods differently. So if you have a, if you do have a rod, um, you can look at it and you can look and see what it says. So this first rod here, this is a Sage, and um, it says it's a 486-4. So what that means is it's a four weight rod. It's eight feet, six inches, four piece. Now this Scott down below, so this says eight feet, eight inches, four line. So what that means is it's a eight foot, eight, and a, eight inch fly rod, four weight. Now this Winston down below is a pier and it's eight and a half feet, four weight. 
So really what you want to do is just when you're looking at your fly rod, um, kind of look to see. So this right here, this is my rod. And it's a 590 dash four. So what that means is it's a five weight, nine feet, zero inches, four piece. Now, kind of the final thing that I'm going to talk about with fly rods is going to be their action. So if you look, this is Angelica, she's casting a really long rod and you can look and see kind of this bend of the fly rod, right? So that's going to be kind of that action. So this graphic just shows that there's different fly rods. You can buy a different fly rod with a different action. So a fast action rod is gonna be where it just kind of bends barely just at the top of that, the tip top of that fly rod. Now, whereas you go to moderate fast and moderate, you can see that that bend of that rod is starting to come down or get lower on the fly rod. Now a slow action fly rod might be like a, a, a cane rod or a bamboo fly rod and or a fiberglass rod. So that's going to be a slower action. So it's going to bend lower into the butt section. Really what you want to get out of this is that um, if you have a slower action fly rod, you have to wait longer um, for your back cast or your forward cast because it takes longer for your rod to bend, therefore for your fly line to unravel behind or in front of you. Now for uh, kind of an average or a new angler, um, a moderate fast or a moderate action fly rod is recommended because you can really feel the action or the bend or load of that fly rod. Now, uh, some questions that I've received, this is my eighth um, online class. So I've definitely had a lot of questions. And one of them I think was a really good one is like, how in the world are you gonna know what the action of this fly rod is? And truly it's when you go to your local fly shop and or go online, look at the manufacturer details and it'll tell you what the action of that fly rod is. And really what I want to say is like embrace our uniqueness, right? So you, myself, or all of us probably have, or we like a different action fly rod. All right. So we're all unique. And so just go and cast those rods and really start to um, feel them and see, and your, your, uh, your preference might change as you become a better caster as well. Now with fly reels, uh, just gonna talk about anatomy and some drag stuff, drag systems. So here's a photo with our real anatomy. Um, so here you have a real seat. So it's right here. That's what's actually going to go up into uh, the fly rod, the butt section. Um, and do know, I do have a video here shortly of how to set up your fly rod by yourself. Um, you have a frame, which is around. You have the handle, <clears throat> which is right here. And that's going to be like how you're going to reel that fish in. Uh, you have an arbor, which is kind of the center portion. Um, and then you have a drag. And the drag, what it is, is it's going to um, either be really, really tight. So this is when I'm pulling, this is actually pretty easy to pull. If I tighten that drag, it's going to be way harder to pull. So within this drag system, what really matters is once you start to catch bigger fish and especially with saltwater, cause those fish are, are a little more feisty than trout and most bass is that you wanna have a, a good drag system, but also one that's fully enclosed. So as, as we know, uh, salt water can be pretty corrosive. And so um, you wanna make sure that that salt water doesn't get into the drag because it could ruin it. And honestly, if you spend a lot of money on a reel, then you wanna make sure that you're taking care of it. Now, as mentioned, uh, the arbor is just kind of that middle, uh, the center part of the fly reel. Um, and this picture just shows that there's two types of arbors. There's a large arbor here. So meaning like this is this middle portion is bigger and there's a smaller arbor. And this is a little more advanced than your 101 level, but um, just know that um, when you are purchasing a reel that you um, kind of want to think about like, what are you going to be using it for? Are you going to have a really fat fly line or maybe a skinnier fly line and or are you going to be fishing salt? So a lot of salt anglers, so saltwater anglers prefer a larger arbor because when they're reeling, they're picking up more fly line and it's faster. So you're reeling that fish in faster. And again, this is something that you can just speak with your local fly shop about um, <clears throat> or connect you know, with the, with the various groups um, around and just ask those questions. 
The other thing too is, you know, some of the more expensive uh, uh, reels actually are anodized. So meaning that they have a chemical process basically that, that uh, coats those fly reels. So again, it's gonna prevent any rusting. So whenever you're using your, your gear and especially in salt water or some sort of alkalitic water or really anything, um, wash it off with fresh water um, just to get that. So just to prevent any erosion. And I'm all about versatility. So if I'm gonna buy a fly reel and spend some money on it, then I want to be able to use it for fresh water and for salt water. Um, so most of my reels I can use for both. And really, again, that's with that seal drag. Um, and you know, I just, I wanna be versatile. And the same goes with my clothing as well. So this is this year, just doing some cross country skiing and literally that entire outfit is what I would wear on a boat. <laughs> so I'm all about, if I'm gonna spend money on technical apparel, I wanna make sure I can hike in it, I can snowshoe in it, I can run in it, I can fish in it. I wanna make sure, just make sure it's versatile. Now, when you have your uh, fly rod, you wanna make sure that it's matched up um, with your fly reel. So let's say we have a, a five weight fly rod. So then we would put a five weight reel on it. And then we would then put a five weight fly line on it as well. So five plus five plus five, so all the same. So if you had a six weight rod, six weight reel, six weight fly line, and you want them all to be matched up. And you'll thank us uh, and you'll thank me if they are matched up because it's really hard to cast a fly line that's not matched up to your fly rod. It could be quite difficult actually. Now with fly lines, um, so again, we kind of covered the fly rod, the fly reel. Now we're gonna talk about fly lines. And again, um, kind of the whole thing within fly fishing is that fly line is actually what's creating the weight in order to cast out and you know to cast a little tiny fly and or a big fly. Now uh, we have a couple things here. If you look at this reel, you can see that um, this pink, that's actually gonna be the backing. And what the backing is, is it's gonna be the backup to your fly line. So that fly line is that heart of fly fishing. The line provides the weight for that fly casting and a fly line is gonna be on average about 90, or so feet. Um, so again, you have your backing, which is the pink here, and I have another video for it as well. And then you're gonna have your fly line attached to your backing. Um, and then we'll have a leader and tippet and a fly. And I'm gonna get um, way more into detail about that here pretty soon. Here's just a good photo, um, just kind of shows that there's the backing. So the backing is actually the blue and the red and your fly line is gonna be the green. So again, backing is the backup to your fly line. To make it a little more confusing, uh, there's three kind of general types of fly lines. Um, and again, I could literally talk for hours about all of the different types of fly lines that are out there. Um, but I think just on a one-on-one -on -one level, it's uh, good to know just what are the kind of generalized, um, the generalized types of fly lines. Uh, number one is gonna be a floating fly line. So this is, um, you know, what we use most of the time. So if you're gonna be fishing top water, um, whether it's a, you know, some sort of a mimicking a bug on top, you can fish it that, that way and or you can go subsurface or underneath. Now a full sink line is totally the opposite. So a full sinking line is gonna be sinking as soon as it touches the water. So it's gonna sink. Now a full sink line is recommended more for lakes versus rivers, just because, you know, we don't really, I mean, we might see some rocks and some trees and whatnot, but you don't really know what's underneath there. So that line could kind of get caught up and you could lose your flies. Now, to kind of combine both types, you can have a sink tip. Uh, so basically it's a floating fly line with a sink tip or a portion of the tip of the fly line that's going to sink. Now this is great for um, both lakes and for rivers and also for ocean uh, fishing. And this is going to be, especially if you're gonna be fishing like a bait fish, um, like a streamer, or you're mimicking a sculpin or a leech or something, um, those are actually going to be lower in the water column. So you want that fly to get down. So in order to do that, um, a sink tip will help kind of get it down to the, the correct portion of the water column where that uh, aquatic prey would actually be. Um, so there's, you know, it's interesting because um, sometimes you get a bit of a sticker shock with fly fishing, really generally anything um, 
with kind of recreational stuff, unfortunately can be expensive. So there are some basic fly rod setups and this uh, tree line review, and again, I'll send you guys this, uh, this link, but they did a great gear review for the best beginner fly fishing combos. So there's so many companies out there and um, this kind of broke it all down and it chose, you know, kind of gave pros and cons for all of them. And at the end of the day, um, if you were to buy a five or a six weight combo fly package, which would be a fly rod, a fly reel, fly line, sometimes a leader and even flies, um, you know, it's going to be a great rod for you. And honestly, you may never get a different fly rod, you know? Um, and so, and no too, like a fish doesn't know if you're fishing a $50 fly rod or a thousand dollar fly rod, right? It's you as the angler, as you progress, you know, become a better caster, you might start to notice that, but honestly that beginner combo, um, can be great. And I, again, will share this, uh, this link with you guys. So here's the video. Um, this is going to be how to set up your fly rod. Cause I think one of the biggest things when I'm teaching, um, women, uh, actually this year, you, I, I think I'm at like 350 students so far and then whatever we have here for this uh, this webinar. So one of the biggest questions and I think kind of um, things is, you know, hey, I've gone fishing before, but, you know, somebody's always set up that rod for me and or, you know, the guide does it all. So I think it's really important to become independent and learn how you can do this yourself because it's actually really easy. So uh, we'll watch the video right now. and I'm founder of United One on the Fly. And one of the biggest questions, especially for a new angler, is how in the world do we set up our fly rod? So I'm gonna show you how to set up your fly rod and then also how to put your fly reel onto your rod and string up your line. So we have a four piece rod here. So this is the butt section, it has our cork. Um, you have the butt mid section, I have the mid top and I have the tip top. So what I like to do first is I'm going to put the two lower sections together first. And how do you know that? Well, sometimes there's dots, some fly rods actually have numbers, um, but basically you want, it's the fattest portion that kind of tapers up. So here's our, our section there. And then I'm gonna take the tip top and I'm gonna take the mid uh, top area, those two and put those together. So I like to put a four piece rod, do this, and then I'm just gonna put them together like so. So there we go. Now our rod is put together. And again, um, sometimes there's little dots that'll help line up the guides or whatever. You'll, you'll discover that with your own fly rod. Next, what we're gonna do is we're going to take our reel. And if you see our reel here has a reel seat, has a reel handle, has a drag, and it's all dependent upon how, um, how you reel. Do you reel with your right hand? Do you reel with your left hand? So you want to put your reel handle on the side that you're going to be reeling. I reel with my left hand most times, so I am going to make sure that my guides are down, like so, and then that my reel handle is going to be on the left side. So all you do is there's actually like a little tiny, um, hole right there and then there is a piece here that's going to also have a hole it slides up and i'll show you how to do that so you take your real seat and you're going to just put it into that hole i hold it either with my um, non-dominant hand or my chest and i take that slide slide it up and then i twist it up like so so we have my our guides are down real handle is on the left side or whichever side you you uh reel Okay, so now we have our reel that is hooked onto our fly rod. Um, next step is that we want to string up our fly rod. So how in the world do you do that? Well, there's a little piece of uh, metal that's right here. And I pull out a bunch of line and then I am going to double it up like so. And then I'm gonna go up and through the metal right there. And I'm gonna just pull this through. Now I do this first before I pull out a bunch of fly line, just because you'd have to be pulling this through that metal piece. So this is uh, good to do that at first. Um, and also the reason you want it behind this piece of metal is that while you're casting, it's just gonna have, may allow you to have better line control. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna string up our rod. Now, as I mentioned, I'm going to be pulling out a bunch of line here. 
Perfect. And then, you know, regardless if you have a $1,000 fly rod or a $10 fly rod, you want to take care of it. So you want to gently place it onto the ground. Okay, so again, we do not, we want to make sure all of this line is pulled out and on the grass or the gravel, wherever you're at when you're stringing up your rod, you again, never want to pull your line out of your reel while it's on the ground. And that's just going to save your reel because it can get dented up or whatnot. Okay, so next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to double up my fly line like so. I'm going to string up the, through the first guide and then I'm going to go up and string through. Now, the reason why I do a double is because if my line drops, it's only gonna drop to right there. So it's not gonna go all the way down. So it just saves you some time. So I'm just gonna continue to uh, string up my rod. Now, again, if I am moving with it, I'm gently placing it down on the ground and then I'm just going to be pulling that line, but it's all of the line that's on the ground. Final tip is to make sure that you have strung your fly line through every single guide before you tie on any flies. And that is how you set up a fly rod. And no, and no to that, um, that video is actually on the United on the Fly YouTube channel. So, um, and we'll send you a link to that also. But what I would suggest is just kind of going out in your um, in your yard and watching the video and just going through it. Kind of that tip of not pulling your fly line uh, off your reel on the ground is huge. I've actually dented one of my reels that I actually broke it. So um, good tip. And also making sure every all of the fly line is up and through the guides is really important. Cause I'll tell you like probably a week or so ago, I put my reel on my fly rod and I just set up all my flies. And then I noticed that I forgot to completely just even string it up. <laughs> so know that that does happen, um, but just make sure it'll save you some frustration um, if every guide is, uh, is strung up. Okay, we're gonna talk about leader and tippet. Um, and you know, this one is kind of one of the hardest things I felt as a new angler to kind of grasp these concepts. So hopefully I explain it well enough and we can again go into the Q&A for this also. And so we can um, and more, you know, have some more explanation. So leaders. Um, so here when you have your, again, I have my reel and then I have my backing, right? The pink, and then I'm gonna have my fly line. Well, attached to your fly line, you're going to have a leader and a leader is going to be that kind of clear, um, clear part. Now, if you've done any type of conventional fishing, you know that you have a reel and then you have a bunch of monofilament that's kind of spooled onto that reel. Well, with fly fishing, we do use monofilament, but we use it in a much smaller amount. So um, on average, uh, a leader is going to be nine feet. Now I say three to four X and I'm gonna go through what those X numbers are. So monofilament, so it's the line that forms the link between the fly line and the fly. Uh, usually they're tapered. So I would say probably 90 to 95% of the time they're going to be tapered. So kind of fatter on the butt section and then tapered down. Again, that, that tapered formula is all to allow that transfer of energy. So when you're casting your fly rod, you're gonna lift, pick up, accelerate, pause. You're transferring all of that energy from your fly rod to your fly line, to your tapered leader, to your fly. So that tapered leader is helpful for that. Now lengths. Um, you know, they can be anywhere from three feet or all the way up to 20, sometimes longer. Um, again, but average length for a leader is going to be nine feet. And strength, so pound test. So <clears throat> also known as X numbers. So if you've done any type of conventional fishing, you might have heard, oh, I caught that salmon on 20 pound test. Well, in fly fishing, we like to kind of mix things up and we use these X numbers. Now, uh, these leader X numbers, so um, what first and foremost, I want to say is as the X number goes up, 
that diameter goes down. So here's four different types of leaders, um, 3X, 4X, 5X, and 6X leaders. Now, if you look here on the 3X leader, you notice that it's 9.5 pounds. So that's 9.5 pound test. Whereas if you look at the 6X leader, it's four pound test. So again, as that number goes up, the diameter goes down. Now, being a nurse, um, or if you guys are in the healthcare, or if you do any jewelry, um, you can think about gauges. So again, uh, as the number goes up, the diameter goes down. So think about IVs. So I would personally much rather have a size 22 needle or IV than I would a size 16. So again, that number goes up, the diameter goes down. Now there's tippet. So you have your leader, um, and then at the tip of your leader is going to be tippet. Again, at the tip of your leader is going to be tippet. Now, the tip of the leader is actually assigned that X number to identify its diameter. So again, as that number goes up, the diameter goes down, and that is uh, the tippet. So here's an example of uh, kind of a tapered leader. And so what we have is a nine foot tapered leader. So at the tip of the leader is the tippet. Okay, so at the tip of this nine foot leader, there's approximately about two feet or so of tippet onto that leader. Now, when you're tying on your tippet or to your leader, you wanna make sure again, cause we wanna keep a tapered formula. So that tapered formula, is going to transfer the energy from your fly rod to your fly line, to your tapered leader, to your fly. So we wanna keep it tapered. So again, if that number, as the number goes up, the diameter goes down, that means that we would have to tie on 3X and then 4X and then 5X, right? So again, as that number goes up, the diameter goes down. So we're keeping that tapered formula. Um, what's incorrect would be where you're going for 3X, uh, 5X and 4X, so you'd go like, you would basically go kind of fat, small, fat, right? So um, it's just not going to transfer the energy correctly. So again, you wanna make sure that you have those numbers in consecutive as they're going up. So leader suggestions. Uh, so a nine foot 3X leader, um, that's gonna be on average for medium sized trout, bass and panfish. Um, and you can always, if you wanted to go smaller diameter, you just tie on some 4X tippet onto your leader. And tippet suggestions. So you actually buy tippet in spools. And um, what I suggest is to buy 3X, 4X, and 5X spools. Now, if you're gonna be going to, uh, let some of you guys said you guys were from Salt Lake City. So there are some uh, more technical, more educated trout kind of on the middle Provo um, or even on the, pro the lower Provo. Um, so you might need maybe five and a half or six X tippet, um, you know, but kind of looking and doing your research as far as in seeing what tippet you might need um, would be a great suggestion, but on average, three to five X tippet will get you um, a fish in most areas around the world. And recyclable. So this monofilament, um, monofilament actually will not break down for 800 years. Um, and then fluorocarbon is 10,000 years. Okay, so um, we as anglers and just outdoor um, individuals, we um, hopefully are conservation minded. So looking for, you know, some sort of a um, recycling um, you know, area that you can put your monofilament, but also if you don't have one, just look at your local website and see, hey, where can I recycle this? And think about micro trash too, as you're cutting this off or any little bits, you wanna make sure that you put it into, this is actually like a little, um, a little garbage. And so this is what I put, I hold it onto my bag and I put, there's a hole in there and I put all of my like micro trash in that. So I have it in one spot. Some people use little, you know, bags or put it in their waders or whatever. All right. So this might be a little more complicated. I know this kind of chart looks a little uh, um, overwhelming, but really you want to match your tippet size to your fly. And so this is a great uh, kind of graph that can show, okay, so if I have a size 12 hook, then I'll probably be using 4X tippet. So a tippet tip for you is going to be, you wanna divide the hook size by three, and that will be what size tippet you'll need. 
Now, if I suggest that you uh, have three to five X spools of tippet and you have a size six uh, fly, you divide that by three and it's two and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't flat fish this fly because Heather told me I need to take my hook size and divide it by three. Um, my suggestion is that you just either round up and or down um, to whatever size tippet you have, right? Um, so how do you know what size hook that you're actually um, fishing with? Well, can't, uh, can't get away with this presentation without some more anatomy. So let's do some hook anatomy. Um, so this is our hook here. It's a, you know, usually you'll see feathers and stuff on it. It's just a bear hook. Uh, so you have the eye of the hook and that is where that tippet was gonna go into the eye of the hook. You have a shank, which is gonna be kind of that uh, long portion of it. The bend, so the hook bend, uh, your barb and then your point. Now, how, what determines what the size of a hook is, is going to be actually the hook gap. So that's the point from your point to your shank, like what's the distance. So that will um, determine that hook size. Now do know that as you kind of progress within this fly fishing journey, you will definitely, um, you'll be able to just pick up a fly and be like, oh, that's a size 12 or kind of guesstimate pretty closely or yeah, the size 12, size 14, you know, kind of be, You'll, you'll, you will get there, I promise. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do now is kind of put it all together. So we have our fly reel, which goes on to our fly rod. Um, so we have a five weight fly reel, five weight fly rod. Uh, we have a five weight fly line. Uh, so we have reeling, uh, reeling, we have reel with our backing. We have our fly line, goes up through the guides, the tip top, and then you have your fly line. Uh, and then from your fly line, you're going to connect your leader uh, and then you're going to have tip it and then you have your fly. Now there's several different types of knots and I'm going to go into the knots here shortly, but, um, and this is, you can refer back to this, take a screenshot of it. Um, so know kind of what the knots are that you might be using in order to connect. So with, with the basic knots, you know, kind of if we, if this was a normal time and I was with you in person, we would be practicing all of these knots together. And my first couple classes, we did watch knot videos. And honestly, without you actually physically tying the knots, I think that I would rather share more knowledge and more information with you about something else. So I will say that all of these, uh, these knots are on the United Way on the Fly YouTube channel. Um, I do suggest that you, um, kind of get paracord that would be um, kind of bigger so it's easier to tie your knots. Um, we also recommend another couple apps and uh, that'll be the next slide. Um, so really kind of focusing and just um, practicing this at home because again the more you practice the better you're going to be at them. Um, and also if you know that you're not going to have service but you're still learning these knots, I usually just take my cell phone and I just will screen you know video like an actual YouTube video and then I have it on in my photos so I can refer back to it while I'm on the river without service. So kind of the basic knots that you'll be able to look up um, on our YouTube channel or Orvis or animated knots and I'll be sending you links to all of those is going to be the blood knot, the loop to loop, double surgeon, and then the clinch knot. Um, and then this is just some so our, why and where you'd be using these knots. Now there's hundreds and hundreds of different knots. Um, again, these are just the basic knots and basic suggestions for um, kind of connecting all of that. So the other two uh, apps that we like to reference is gonna be the uh, Orvis Learning Center. It has a great kind of animated knot section. Um, and speaking of animated, animated knots is a great uh, resource as well. They actually have a app that I believe it's maybe a couple dollars, but you can go on and you can just search whatever knot you're looking for and you can watch it. Um, so that's two other options um, to kind of learn those knots. And here's some tips for your knots. So practice makes perfect again. So the more you have practicing the knots, the faster you're gonna become. So wraps. Um, so as I mentioned with tippet, as the number goes up, the diameter goes down. So with wraps, you wanna have more wraps with smaller diameter or a larger number, and you wanna have less wraps with larger diameters. So a 3X uh, tippet or 3X liter, you might only do five wraps, whereas a 5X liter or and or tippet, you would do five or six wraps, okay? 
Uh, so, and leave a little insurance. So when trimming your knot, leave yourself a small tag. And I have a photo that will show kind of what I'm taught referring to when I talked about um, clipping the tag in. Um, so, you know, some people will be like, oh, I have to cut it so close because a fish might see it. And the reality is, is if a fish hasn't seen your nine foot leader, it's not gonna see a little tiny tag in. So give yourself a little insurance. Moisture. So in order to fully seat that knot, you want to just a little spit, maybe water, whatever. You really want to get that, um, that material wet. And so, and then pull that knot really slowly. So that'll seat the knot correctly and also not cause any like um, squigglies or anything with that specific uh, tippet. And test your knot. What a bummer if you just caught a fish of a lifetime and it was a bad knot and it came undone. So I always test my knot first. And by doing that, I just kind of pull on the knot with, you know, whatever, and just to make sure that it's not going to come undone. And spare some tippet. You know, as you become a better knot tier, you might not be using so much, but, you know, it's okay. Give yourself a little grace, you know, just uh, as you're learning to spare some, some extra tippet. Now, when I was talking about trimming the knot, this is what I meant. So this is actually a zoomed, closed up, close picture. Um, so this is the kind of tag end trimming. So you want to just leave a little bit um, when, you're, when you're tying it. And again, this is just another graphic. Um, I'm a visual learner, so I like to see things multiple times. Um, so this is just another graphic of all of the knots that would be kind of from your reel to your fly. And again, these are based the kind of basic suggestions. Um, and as you kind of progress in your journey, you might be use a different knot or you might learn something new or certain fishing techniques might require a different knot. But again, these are just the basics. And nippers. So, you know, we need some way to be able to cut or trim our, uh, our tippet. So, you know, there's uh, a couple, there's several different types of brands of, of nippers, and you could even go to Walgreens and just get a, a toenail clippers. But I will say that the good thing kind of with the fly fishing nippers and benefit is going to be this little tiny poker, right? So you can see there's one here on this one and then there's one here. And what that's used for is if you buy or let's say you tie your own flies and or you buy flies, well, a lot of times they're going to, um, the fly tire might use glue. So they're going to use glue to finish that fly. Well, a lot of times that glue actually gets caught into the eye of the hook. So you want to use this little poker, which will poke through the eye of the hook, which then allows you um, to put your tippet into your fly. So poker is good. And you need some sort of forceps. So um, to remove the fish, uh, the fly from the fish's mouth, but also to pinch the barb. So um, as we kind of talked about with catch and release and knowing the tips and the principles, um, well, the number one cause of harm to a fish is going to be a barbed hook. And so quick and easy, you can just pinch that barb down. It's a little piece kind of at the point of, uh, of that hook. And um, you pinch it down and it's gonna cause less harm to the fish. And truly, if you're, you're practicing catch and release and you wanna release your fish anyways, it's best to kind of do everything that you could to cause the least amount of harm to that fish. And finally, know that bird's nest happen, right? So uh, with this, you know, like, you might be casting and everything gets all all tangled up and even as a you know experienced angler i was fishing nevada last week or a couple days ago and i still got tangled up so just know that this happens this is when you stop you take a deep breath you look around and you're like oh yeah fish don't live in ugly places um just you know kind of find that find your inner peace and then start to uh to tie everything back Perfect. I think we're doing, we're doing pretty good on time. Awesome. I'm actually right on time. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about types of flies and rigging. And what I mean by rigging is going to be kind of how do you set up these different uh, systems in order to fish certain fishing techniques. So kind of on a one-on-one -on -one level, we're going to talk about the different types of flies. So dry flies. So dry fly floats. It's going to be any mature stage of an adult insect. So you may have heard the terms mayfly, caddis, stonefly, midge. So an adult, uh, adult fly is going to float and it's gonna be, that's the adult dry stage of it. 
Now a wet fly is going to sink, so it's going to be more under the water. Um, it's just below the surface, and it's imitating either a drowned adult, drifting, or hatching insects. Um, and then you have a nymph, and a nymph is going to sink, and it's any immature stage of an aquatic insect. Now, as you kind of start to, uh, again, go down this journey in fly fishing, you're going to start to learn um, kind of the entomology or the bugs of this. And you'll quickly learn that there's, you know, uh, four different stages of a mayfly that we fish all four stages. You know, there's th there's different stages of a caddis and we fish different stages. Um, so knowing that the nymphs are going to be the immature stages of whatever bug and then a dry fly is going to be the adult or mature stage of a bug. Now here's some graphics just to kind of show like in um, kind of where are those flies at, you know, in relation when you're casting them out, where are they going to be on the water? Um, whenever I'm fishing, my number one thing is I'm always thinking about, okay, what am I fishing? What am I mimicking? And also where would that um, natural, you know, is it a natural bug? Where is it going to be in the water column? So a dry fly, again, a dry fly, it's a mature stage of an adult insect and it's going to be on top it's going to float now you can do a dry fly just by itself as a single and or you can do a tag end so a dropper um, so it, the dropper could I also be another dry fly so you could have two dry flies and or you could do a dry fly with a nymph or a subsurface dropper okay um, so what you would do is you just tie some tippet um, onto the hook bend of your you fly here and then you would tie that end of the tippet into the eye of the hook of your second fly. Now I will say that fish feed subsurface or underwater 85 to 90 percent of the time. So to be most successful um, fishing subsurface is going to be it's going to give you the greatest chance of actually catching a fish. Now I'm kind of a um, a sucker for I love dry fly fishing so if I start to see fish coming up and rising and eating some adult bugs then I switch over to a dry fly that's just me even though I know that I'm not going to catch as many fish I just love that specific technique so a great way that kind of what I would do is a dry dropper so I still might catch something on a dry fly but the reality is, is I'm probably going to catch it on the dropper now, when you're fishing a dry fly, and again, in a mature stage of a bug, um, you need some sort of floatant. So this is some different uh, types of dry fly floatant. There's spray, there's powder, there's a kind of viscous material. Um, and this is kind of what you will, um, you'll discover and you'll see what your local uh, shops have. I prefer, I love this dry magic, like one little tube lasts me for over a year. Um, and that's my own personal preference, but you'll, you know, talk to your fly shop, talk to your community and you ask them what they like best. There's so many different products out there. And again, as I mentioned, fish feed subsurface 85 to 90% of the time underwater. So your best bet to catch a fish and be most successful is gonna be fishing underwater. So while we're fishing underwater, this is that wet fly. Again, it's just below the surface. It's imitating a drowned adult uh, insect. It's a drifting and or hatching insects. And what a hatching insects means is that, you know, at one time they're kind of on the bottom of the, um, of the you know, riverbank or wherever, and then they're going to start to hatch. So they're going to come up and then become an adult. And so fishing that hatching stage can be really, really productive. And then finally, we have a subsurface or a nymph, um, different types of setups. And again, a nymph is going to sink and it's any immature stage of an aquatic insect. So here we have uh, a nymph where we have a weighted fly. So our one fly is gonna be kind of lower. Again, I'm always thinking about where is that fly within relation to the water column. Um, and then I have a nymph, another lighter nymph that's gonna be um, kind of tied on to it, or you can use weight. So you can have split shot or use something here where you have two flies. So it's all kind of dependent on what you um, what you want to use and what you have. Um, I would say knowing um, your regulations. So there are some waters that do not allow lead weight um, or lead flies. So you know again, that's where you would check your local regulations just to um, make sure that you're uh, within the law. 
And here's just some examples of split shot. There's again, just like dry fly floating, there's so many different types of uh, split shot. So here's just some great examples. And you need some in, uh, strike indicator and or a bobber um, in order to be able to tell like, you know, it, it did that my the fish actually eat my fly. So again, just like there's so much dry fly float and there's so many um, uh, different types of split shot, there's also several different types of indicators as well. Now, when we're fishing our fly, whether it's a wet fly, a dry fly, and or a nymph, most of the time we want to fish it on a dead drift. And so what that means, a dead drift is where that a perfect float, so the fly is traveling at the same pace as the water. So in order, this could be used again for a dry fly, for nymph, a wet fly, and even some streamer fishing. And streamer fishing is going to be where it's mimicking a bait fish. So you're mimicking a smaller little tiny fish. Now, in order to achieve a dead drift, you can do an aerial and or a water mend. So an aerial mend is where you're gonna be casting and you're mending your line uh, in the air. Whereas if you're a water mend is where you're going to cast and then you mend your fly line, you either pull it up or downstream in order to keep that natural presentation of a dead drift, but that fly line is on the water. Now, this is a great uh, video of my friend, uh, Kristen, who's actually anybody that's kind of in the Tacoma area. Um, so this is a great example of a dead drift. So the fly will be showing, it's come, there it is. It's on, again on that dead drift. That's the reality of fly fishing is that we miss some fish. Um, but watching that is that fly, so she cast it and that fly again was moving on a dead drift and a dead drift is moving at the same speed or pace of the water. So she didn't have to mend her line where she didn't have to lift her line either up or downstream. She just let it go. Um, and sometimes, you know, actually a lot of times that happens. We set the hook too fast. We just don't hook the fish. We miss it. It comes off. Like that's the reality of fly fishing, but that's what keeps us come, going back. Now we did, uh, these are flies, right? So we obviously need some sort of flies. And in a intro 101 level, um, we don't get too much into, well, we don't get into entomology at all. Um, but do know that, um, you know, you just need a kind of a, a, an assortment of flies. And this is where you would go to your local fly shop and or connect with your community or, you know, reach out to United Women the Fly and we can help you uh, maybe give you a few ideas as far as what bugs you might need for whatever specific fishery. Um, but also, you know, look at the local fishing report within the, the fly shop. So let's say you're going to go to Yellowstone this year and you go, you start looking up stuff, you see big sky anglers, you go to their fishing report and they say, oh, a person purple haze is what's working. And you're like, is Jimi Hendrix like on the water? I have no idea what a purple haze is. So that's when you go to whatever, uh, you know, you look on the internet, you research it, you type in purple haze fly, and then you click on images and you can look and see what that looks like. So I honestly uh, will do that for most flies that I have no idea what the name is because Again, these names are a, an artistic expression truly by the artist or the fly designer. So they can name them whatever they want. Um, so I, uh, I always just kind of research via the internet to see what they look like. And you need some sort of fly boxes. So there's different types of fly boxes uh, for different size flies, different, you know, really thin, bigger and whatnot. Um, so United One on the Fly just did, and we're still doing it, um, for the month of uh, April, we're doing um, our Tuesday tips, we're doing fly box organization. Um, we also have a presentation that we did last, uh, last week on how to organize your fly boxes. So that's all free, it's all accessible via our website. We have a ton of blog posts on, on all of these fly boxes as well. Cool, all right. So fly casting. So 
again, this is kind of that intro like dabbling, right? So we're kind of giving you the equipment, some of the flies, and now let's do a little kind of dabbling into fly casting. First and foremost, you have to practice, just like with uh, your tying the knots, you know, think about how many hours Venus and Serena have in, in practicing tennis, right? So the better angler you will be, the, the more you practice casting, the better angler you're gonna be and the more fish you're gonna catch. So this is when you wanna practice out on the, your lawn or you know somewhere off of the water, it's always best to practice when you're not fishing. Um, and there's a couple of different organizations that we recommend or I recommend um, with casting videos. I'm huge on drills. So I think about like the WNBA, right? Those women, um, they are practicing line drills or practicing free throws or practicing layups, right? So the only way that they're gonna get better is by doing drills and just really focusing and getting those fundamentals down. Now the Fly Fishers International has a great uh, website with tons of casting videos um, and they're pretty short so you can watch those. And then Orvis, Orvis has an amazing um, uh, resource for casting videos as well. So you can go in and learn base, like the basics all the way to advanced casting. So I would really recommend um, watching those, uh, those videos. Now, when we talk about, or we think about uh, casting, we think about a clock and you might've heard people say, okay, so I need to drive at a 10 and a two. Well, sometimes people will say you wanna cast at a 10 and a two. So forward is my 10 two is gonna be my, my back behind me, okay? So this kind of just gives you a visual for, um, for your casting. Now you might hear the terms kind of forward stroke and backstroke, right? So forward cast, back cast. And again, this just shows you that um, in reference to your clock here. So 11 o'clock and one o'clock. Now there's three different types of casting loops. Um, and really just what a casting loop is, is the shape of the fly line that's formed by the, the rod tip path. So three different types. There's your, uh, so there's your narrow loop, your wide loop, and your tailing loop. So the first one we're going to talk about is the tailing loop. That's bad. So we don't, this is not what we are looking for. We don't want this, uh, this loop. Um, now, as you progress in your uh, fly fishing journey, again, um, there are ways or things that you could do that actually would um, prevent this tailing loop. And again, this is when you really are focusing on your casting and uh, maybe working with um, a, your local fly shop, getting a casting lesson or whatnot. Now a narrow loop is kind of what, what is optimal. This is what we are really looking for. Now a narrow loop is going to be, it's great for windy conditions. It's great for accuracy. Um, I like to think of it as a baseball, right? So a baseball for your narrow loop and a wide loop would be a beach ball. So if it's really windy, so you can throw a baseball and it can cut through the wind. Whereas if it was a really windy day and you threw a beach ball, you know, a wider ball, it's gonna get kind of caught up in that wind and it's going to not be as efficient, right? So that's the way I look at a narrow loop versus a wide loop. Now there are some great advantages for a wide loop as well. So if let's say you're using two flies and I noticed um, on the, um, the chat, some people said, know your regulations because some places only allow one fly and that is true. And some places actually allow three flies. I've never cast, I've never fished three flies because I know that I'd get all tangled up. But if you're using heavier flies and or two flies, three flies, a wider loop is better because a narrow loop, they could get all tangled up. Whereas a wide loop, they're not gonna get as tangled. So there are some, some, you know, some good things with a wide loop as well. Now, the number one cast uh, really to learn kind of the fundamentals, and I will say that I practice a pickup lay down drill every single time I am practicing and I'm casting out on the water. Um, so there's really five steps to a pickup lay down, and I'm going to show a video for this. And again, this is a Fly Fishers International video, so you um, can go and I'll be sending the links to this, but this talks about that basic pickup lay down. You know, if you've watched a river run through, a uh, river runs through it, you know how beautiful the casting is and everything. Well, the reality is fish don't have wings. So the more time that your flies on the water, the more chances you have to catch a fish. So being able to just have your fly on the water, lift up, pick, cast it, and then lay it back down. This is going to be your number one um, most efficient fishing cast. 
now here's a video um, and I will we'll start it. The pickup and lay down is one of those foundational casts that you can use at almost any skill level as a flying one. But it's probably also the first cast that you're going to learn when you learn to cast. We're going to start with the rod tip low on the water with the line mostly straight out in front of us. We're going to lift to a position that's going to allow us to clear the line from the water and allow us to start the next acceleration phase. Here, we're going to smoothly accelerate the rod to an abrupt stop and pause and then come back down. What I want to do is show you that without the line so we can slow it down. We're going to start with the rod tip low in front of us, line mostly straight. We're going to lift the rod, again clearing the line from the water, and now we're gonna smoothly accelerate to an abrupt stop behind us, making sure that the loop is traveling in an upward direction, clearing the line from the water. We're gonna pause, waiting for the loop to unroll. That means waiting for the fly line to unroll behind us. Now we're gonna repeat that, and we're gonna smoothly accelerate to a stop, and then drop the line to the water. I wanna show you that now in real time. We're gonna lift, smoothly accelerate to a stop and pause, and then come forward. Now there's a couple of errors that you might run into when you're doing this cast. The first one is dropping the rod tip back too far. Doing that will end the fly up in a grassy situation. We might pop the fly off. What we wanna do is have that cast behind us go high and away from any obstruction. The other thing we wanna make sure of is that we're not coming down too far in front. We want to make sure that we stop at a high enough point that allows the loop to unroll and then drop the rod tip. That's the pickup and lay down. Cool. Um, and again, I would we'll send this link out for your video. Um, but this is just that's your fundamental basic cast. And I I honestly every time I'm out, um, that's kind of my warm up is just the pickup lay down when I'm practicing and casting out on the grass. Now uh, we have like 15 more minutes. So I'm going to go through some accessories um, and then we're going to open up to Q&A. Um, first and foremost, you need some sort of bag or a vest or something in order to, to uh, keep your, all of your stuff in it. Um, so I, you know, I'm 5'1", so I'm not exactly tall. So when I'm wading out a little bit deeper, um, I prefer a waterproof bag, um, partly because I live in the Pacific Northwest, but also um, if, if I'm short, then that means the, the bag won't get wet. Um, so you need some, you know, some sort of bag. Now boots. So you can, um, and we're, we'll go through some waiter stuff, but you need some sort of waiting boot. So a couple of things, you really wanna have some good ankle support. Um, and then also I've torn off two toenails in 2020. Maybe it's just cause it was 2020, but um, because I wore Chacos. So I do not recommend wearing Chacos at when you're, when you're fishing, um, wear some sort of boot just to protect your feet. Um, so there's two different types of bottoms of these boots. You can get a felt bottom and or you can get a Vibram sole. Now um, the felt bottoms, which I'll go back, so they're going to be the most secure, but in some places it's actually illegal to fish with felt bottoms because um, some of the invasive aquatic species can actually adhere to that felt. Um, so if you do use felt, um, you want to make sure that you really clean, scrub those boots um, with some water, some bleach, bleach and water and soap, and then let them dry out in the sun um, and make sure that you're not going from one water right way to the other, right? So um, if you are using felt, you want to be more mindful. And do you know, like in Alaska, you actually can't wear felt boots as well as um, Yellowstone or some of the national parks. Now a Vibram sole um, is great, it's legal. Um, however, sometimes it can be, it's not as secure. So you can do a couple of things. You can actually put cleats and or um, 
like little studs into your boots. Um, I did a, a write up on there's different on the different types of studs and cleats because certain studs and cleats some will adhere to a more of a basalt rock and others will adhere to a uh, like a granite like a hard rock um, versus a soft rock. So I like to have here this photo on the left. I have kind of a, a different array of both types because I want to you know use this boot to fish everywhere and there's different types of rocks wherever I go. Um, and I do have I'll send the link out to that blog post so you can read it at your leisure. Um, and this is a great, so cleat stud option. So again, just kind of shows uh, the different options that you have. Now, wading socks. So you actually can wet wade in the summer. So you don't need to have waders on all the time. So if it's hot out, um, I suggest, you know, wearing some sort of like these kind of neoprene socks and or just wading socks, um, or you can just wear normal socks and put them in your, um, in your wading boots. But again, closed toed shoes are gonna be best. And here's just a cool photo, underwater photo. You can see that I have my boot, I'm wet waiting, I have tights on. So this is like 50 SPF tights and then I have my waiting socks over it. So waders, oh man, this is like, this is the subject that we have a, United Wanna Fly has a closed Facebook group and literally this question is asked like every week, like, oh my gosh, I'm this body type, what waiter should I use? Now I have the different waiter brands and I will, we will send out links for that. Um, but just know, so if you look at this photo, you can look at all four women are different body types. Now all four women have the same brand on, but each, each specific waiter is gonna be different. Actually, Jay Michelle, who's here on the left, those are men's waiters. So what I would really like to emphasize is that fit or get a pair of waiter that fits your body well. And so sometimes, you know, women fit better into a, a men's waiter, whereas even some men fit better into women's waiters. So just fit what, or get what fits you well. Now these are Caddis. I'm just gonna kind of quickly roll through some of the different brands that you might uh, see. Uh, Drift makes women waiters. Miss Mayfly. Miss Mayfly is uh, known for having kind of a, um, a much larger body waders. Um, and so it's a great resource if, you know, sometimes maybe your, your hips are a little bit wider than, than others or whatnot. So it's great options. Uh, Orvis makes some waders. And you can see too here, it's three different body types. So it's so awesome that finally uh, manufacturers are starting to work towards kind of a more inclusive uh, kind of um, technical apparel for women. Patagonia makes waders. Reddington, so they're out of Seattle, kind of Bainbridge Island, so they make waders as well. Um, yeah, and again, we'll be sending links to all these different waders so you can kind of look and, and see. Now, waiting belt. So waiting belt is not just to look fashionable, although you can make it that way, but it's actually a safety, um, a safety thing. So you want to make sure that your waiting belt is tight enough so that way if you were to fall in, water would not go into your waders. And really with your waiting belt, you want to make sure that you have a buckle waiting belt because that way, if you did get caught, right, like if you got taken down the river um, and you got caught up in some tree or something, you could just unsnap your, your waiting belt. So waiting staff and PFD. So this is this picture was not me going down the river. Uh, this was for picture purpose. Uh, but you know, when I'm fishing, especially in the winter or like spring right now, so there's a thing called runoff. And what runoff is, for those that don't know, is kind of when all that snow starts to melt, obviously that water has to go somewhere. And most of the time it's going to go into the rivers and or what lakes or whatnot. So those rivers get higher, they get dirtier, and they get more dangerous. And so I tend to wear a PFD or a personal flotation device if I'm in kind of a dangerous, you know, or high water. Um, and then I use a waiting staff as well. Whistle. Whistle is always good, especially any outdoors person should always have a whistle. And different types of, of lenses of fly of glasses, right? So I'm not going to go into every single color, but but know that you can research, you know, if you're going to go out to open water and fish the ocean, you might need a blue lens. Whereas if you're going to be fishing um, kind of lower light, more cloudy weather, you might need a yellow lens. So there's different lens colors for different specific types of water as well as different days. 
and a rubber net. So um, it's better on the fish. It's gonna remove less slime uh, from a fish and it's, it's easier to net your fish than to drag it onto the bank or whatnot. It's just better for the fish. And it looks really cool in photos. And some of the final thoughts, I'm just gonna go through um, some of this information. This is me my, and my mom. This is where she's been a rock star and this amazing little caster now. She's just catching fish and doing awesome. Um, some of my final thoughts is, you know, share your knowledge, right? So now um, some of this information that you, you may already have known most of it, or maybe you've never even heard any of this, you know, but now you know something more than somebody else. So it's really important for us to continue to keep the sport alive and just, you know, continue to keep this amazing inclusive community. We want to make sure that we share this information and, um, you know, share the love of just the outdoors. And we want to feature you. So when you're out on your adventures, be sure to tag United on the Fly. Be sure to tag She Jumps. Like we want to feature you. We love embracing and showcasing and spotlighting all of your guys' amazing adventures. So please, you know, include us in those. And what's next after this, this class? What are you going to do? Well, time on the water, truly. The only way you're going to get better is by practicing and just getting out there and doing it. Time on the water and future education, you know, so you can continue. Hopefully I'll get to meet some of you guys in Montana in August. Um, but, you know, look at your local shops, go on YouTube. There's so much education out there. Um, you know, look at your local clubs, connect with United Women on the Fly. Um, yeah. And we are offering, um, we have other online classes as well. On Saturday, I'm doing a Fly Fishing 201 class. Um, it's in like Saturday morning. And so I go, I dive deep into a lot. So if this was basic for you, um, the 201 class is probably going to be more your style. And as I mentioned, I go, I go pretty deep. Um, and you can find out more about it on our website as well. And fly casting. So you want to practice first and foremost, uh, video yourself. So take your phone, have somebody video if you have that, um, if you're lucky to have that. If not, prop your phone up on a tree or rock or a car or whatever and watch your cast. You'll be amazed. Unfortunately, the video doesn't lie. So um, you might be able to kind of tweak some of your, um, your, your casting faults. And watch again those FFI videos and get a casting lesson. It's you know it's it's worthy of getting a lesson um, to just be better. So virtual monthly meetings. United Wanna Fly does a virtual monthly meeting. Um, our next one is May third, and we're going to be doing trip preparation and organization. So kind of how do you prepare for a fly fishing trip? How do you pack it? How do you organize your car? As well as what are those things like thinking about. Uh, your flows, looking at all, you know, kind of thinking about all of the different things you might need to know when you're kind of going out in the summer. And then finally, like you and I, we do live Q&A sessions. So know that this again is just the beginning of your journey and, uh, you know, just connecting with communities and with people or local fly shops or local groups in your area, just um, connecting and just talking and asking questions and uh, just uh, being a part of this amazing community. And I'm gonna go to q and I will say that all of the fly fishing links, um, so anything that was in this presentation, I will be sending off. Um, and so that way uh, you guys will get that in uh, a follow-up email as well. And I'm gonna stop my share. And whoa, I'm looking at the chat and there's a lot of information. <laughs> Um, cool. So with your Q and A, um, I don't know, Christy, are we able to stop the webinar format and have it open up or? We are not. Okay. <laughs> so okay, no in worries. webinar format, everyone. Yeah, yeah. No problem. <laughs> cool. Um, so were there questions? Um, let's, what kind of questions, uh, were there that I can help answer? Many of the questions were answered through the okay. Q&A section. Awesome. Uh, Brooke, Sophie, Sue, would you like to chime in with any that weren't um, or that need to be addressed that were caught up in the chat? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, uh, 
and um, one was waiters versus something. I've lost it now. Uh, swampers. Well, yeah, swampers. And I don't know what a swamper is. So I'm not sure if that <laughs> is what was meant to be said. I don't, I know, no, uh, no um, disrespect for the person asking it, but I'm not sure what a swamper is. So I didn't answer that. I would, you know, maybe it's uh, hip boots, maybe, or something, you know, sometimes people will see hip boots versus waiters. And okay. uh, honestly, I think uh, a pair of waiters is going to be first and foremost safer. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and especially if you're wade fishing. Um, and for me, I'm five one. So if I had hip boots, I wouldn't be able to go out that deep first and foremost. Um, but I think if hip boots are all that you have, or I don't know what swampers are either. I could research it. Um, just like I don't know what all the fly names are. I always just research and click on images and I learn so much. But um, yeah, I would say if that's what you have, utilize it, go out and use it. Um, but if if you're looking, I would definitely say waders are gonna be, uh, are gonna be safer and better um, personally, more breathable as well. And know in the, the summertime, um, you don't, always have to wear waders. You can wet wade again, if you, you know, wearing those socks, but your wading boots and make sure that you have closed toed shoes. <laughs> the Vibram on Chacos is slippery. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, let's see what other kind of questions. What's the best way to find other women who might be interested in getting together? I love that question, Holly. Um, so definitely connect with she jumps, you know, as they uh, start to, and they continue this kind of this fishing and fly fishing um, portion. So I'm sure you'll be able to connect with other, um, are you guys like giraffe corn? What are you, what's an actual she jumps name? Is it, I know it's giraffe corn, but do you guys have like a, a name that you call each other or? Uh, we do refer to each other as giraffe corns, anyone okay. really. <laughs> I love it, that's awesome. So yeah, make sure just connect with the women and she jumps and your lo those local chapters. Um, and you can also go on to, uh, Unite Women on the Fly has a closed Facebook group. There's, thir well, there's 40, like 4,400 women in the group. And within those 4,400 women, there's like 3,900 of them are active. So it's a great way to connect. And it's truly cool because you can go couch, couch surfing in Tasmania, Australia sometimes, right? So it's a great way to just meet other women, um, other like-minded people and, um, and fish and feel safe and feel you know like included. So look at that. Um, also, if you go onto our website, um, we have a connect, you can click on connect, same thing. And you can find women's fly fishing groups all over the world. Um, whoever's put themselves onto the website, you can find that. So that's a great, uh, great resource. And just connect, get on Instagram and look at hashtags or start following stuff and really just make relationships. It's all about just, yeah, putting yourself out there and be like, hi, I, your fishing's awesome. You know, just like connecting and, and developing these relationships. Um, yeah. What else? Uh, I've got a question from Lisa in the Q&A chat. Awesome. Can we talk a bit about etiquette? I want to be respectful as I am fishing with others and often feel like I'm in the way and fumbly in my newness. Tips to be <laughs> respectful and or comfortable taking up your space on the river. Oh, uh, that's such a great question. Thank you so much. Um, first and foremost, if you want to be with people that don't make you feel uncomfortable, right? That I want to give you uh, some, I'll give you some good water or whatnot, but um, you know, there are, especially with COVID, some of these rivers are starting to become a little more crowded. Um, so etiquette, um, basically, if, if you weren't there first, that angler that's there kind of has that little section of water. Um, so things to think about is, you know, kind of each river can be different as far as how close you can get to another angler. And what I would do is if I came up to a new piece of water, I wasn't familiar with really like how close the etiquette is, I'd kind of like look up and downstream and see what other anglers are doing. That'd be the first and foremost thing. But if it's a river that not too many people are on and somebody's already on a piece of water, I would just go to it. I would hike or move on to another run or another piece of water. Um, or you can always, uh, you know, if, if you feel comfortable and you feel safe, you can approach that person and say, hey, can I fish above you? Can I fish below you? So you can ask. I mean, when in doubt, just ask. 
The other thing too is make sure that you're going behind the angler. So you don't want to like walk through somebody's water um, or disturb the water. So if there was a fish, then, you know, kind of spook that fish. So I always, even when I'm rowing a boat, I'm always trying to row behind the angler so I'm not in their water. If I'm rowing and I can't get behind them because it's too shallow, then I will row on the furthest outer part of it and so try to go around them that way. Um, so really etiquette is look around, see how close people are, um, and then talk to the other person if you feel safe, of course, um, and just kind of evaluate that and then walk behind them. Don't walk in front of or through somebody's water. Um, dogs can also be an interesting thing with etiquette. Um, obviously, we all love our four legged uh, children, um, but know that a lot of times some dogs and certain breeds love the water. And so if you have this dog with you and then they jump in the water and then they kind of, uh, you know, spooked all the fish, some of your friends might be upset. So um, just kind of talking to whoever you're with and just, you know, talking about it. As far as with a group, let's say you have four people. Sometimes, you know, you have a piece of water. There's different sections of water. Um, and that's, you know, kind of as you progress in your journey, you'll learn, but you can divide up a, a section of water by four people and then just talk to them and see, say, hey, you know, do rock, paper, scissors, or I'll get the top of the run, you get the lower part of the run, and just talk to each other. And um, maybe the next time just alternate and flip flop as well. So hopefully that helped answer it. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, one question just got answered, but I wanted you to talk about it as well. Um, about hiking along and up and in the rivers, <laughs> how many miles do you estimate you usually hike? Great question. Uh, it, you know, it totally depends. If the fishing's amazing, I'll probably end up hiking less. Um, but there are a lot, you know, especially with COVID too, there's the rivers are more crowded and the water is more, more crowded. So um, you wanna probably get off the beaten path and do a little more hiking. Um, you know, on average, I have a seven mile hike that I do kind of in and out. Sometimes I'll hike up a trail that parallels the river and then I hike down and then I take the river and, and fish it down back to the trailhead. So I'll do that. Um, but on average, I would say probably only a couple of miles. Um, if I'm by myself, especially, I try to stay fairly close to the road just for safety reasons, you know, in North Idaho, we have bears, we have wolves, we have all, but really I'm most scared of two-legged creatures such as humans. <laughs> so I tend to uh, stay closer, if I, especially if I'm by myself, if I fall in or something happens. Um, but if I'm with girlfriends or whatever, then I'd say two to three miles. And sometimes, I mean, there's certain lakes that you could hike into, camp. I mean, you can do all kinds of different activities, mountain biking and go in or snowshoeing into a spot. Um, but I, for me personally, on average, about two to three miles is probably the most, um, unless, you know, saltwater fishing, sometimes I'm like five to 10 miles if I'm walking the flats. So yeah, it all depends. What else? Um, pa backpacking rods are made well, not to stand up to fishing well. Oh, sorry, I'm just, trying to see what else there is. Um, there, it looks like there's one from Sarah in okay. the Q&A. Um, if I can't make the 201 course, can I still register and get sent the recording? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's all recorded. You'll get all of the links as well as the recording with the password. And then also it uh, allows you to come into all the Q&As. Plus I sent a weekly uh, education email so we're always, it's all about sharing the love with education. So you'll get all of that as well. And you can find it on the, um, on the website. So yeah. What other questions? There's another really good one. Yeah, bring it. I want to <laughs> um, What is a single hand versus a spay rod? Ooh, great question. Uh, so single hand rod is going to be where you cast with one hand spay rod or a two-handed rod is where you cast with two rods. That's like the basic, most uh, basic definition. Um, now a single hand rod, um, let's see. So spay rods were actually developed in on the Spay River in Scotland. Um, and really one of the, the main reasons for that, it was a, a larger river and they were trying to 
cast pretty far out to Atlantic salmon. So with a two-handed and or a spay rod, um, you have different types of casts. And most of the time you're gonna be fishing for larger fish, but also for in larger rivers. So big rivers. Um, the other thing too is your fishing technique. So when you're using a spay rod and or a two-handed rod, you're gonna do a technique called swinging the fly. So basically what it is, is it's gonna mimic um, a bait fish, also a soft tackle, which would be a wet fly. So you could um, fish either or, and sometimes I even swing a dry fly. So it's, again, this is when it's not on a dead drift, it's actually under tension and it's going and swinging down the water. Um, so whereas with a single hand rod, it's gonna be shorter, you're using uh, one hand um, and you're going to be fishing kind of shorter areas uh, different types of fly lines, different types of casts, and you can do, you fish on a more of a dead drift. <laughs> Hopefully that helps. It's just like a spay rod or like you're swinging the fly, meaning again, it's under tension and you're swinging or that fly is moving fairly quickly. I mean, you can mend it, either move your line either up or downstream in order to slow it down or speed it up but um, that's kind of the basic, the difference between uh, the two. Um, Sarah Cleaver had a great question earlier of if you know of any environmentally friendly substitutes for things like float ins or other materials that you'd use while fishing. That's a great question. Um, unfortunately, like with monofilament and fluorocarbon, that's, there, there are not any substitutes as of right now. Um, that's why definitely looking at, you know, where you can recycle. Um, most rivers or a lot of the different, like Trout Unlimited and different organizations within certain communities will put out those monofilament recycling bins. Um, and they, they burn them or, and or they'll make them into, I mean, they melt the plastic down and they make it into benches and they can recycle that. Um, as far as floatants, there's definitely more um, kind of eco-friendly floatants versus others. Um, and that's something you would want to just kind of do a little research on, probably a quick little internet search to see, and then um, and just try to use those. I know that there are more natural, uh, natural products. I will say that um, Airflow, which is an indicator, so a bobber, um, so they've actually gone, that used to be plastic, the indicator, and now they've gone to a biodegradable um, material for their strike indicators. Um, so I know that companies are definitely starting to think about that, as well as like DWR coating for all of our clothing that we use, right? DWR coating is great. However, all those PCBs and everything that's in the water is not so great, um, just for the earth, for the fish, for the you know, wildlife, and, and for us. Um, so I know that there are a lot of companies that are definitely, you know, looking into that and, um, and changing their ways. So I would say for floatants, that would just be a quick little internet search. I'm sure that there's much, um, you know, I've actually honestly have never looked. I know that there's one a thing called Flyagra. Um, it's pretty, it's not the best for the environment, so I don't use it. Um, it actually smells like lighter fluid but I use that uh, dry magic, which is kind of a really viscous. And honestly, I've never looked up to see what the most uh, environmental, you know, friendly uh, floating is. But thank you, Sarah, I'm gonna look that up because that's a really good question. Um, yeah. But look at like for the recycling for your monofilament and your fluoro, just research, you know, um, where do you take it? You know, and if you find stuff, because think about all of that's going to be within the, you know, birds get caught up in it. All, I, we, I was on Pyramid Lake this last week and we had a fish that was all caught up in a bunch of lines. So we had to rescue it, you know. So if you see any trash or anything, just pick it up and then recycle it as well. So, um, yeah. Great question. Thank you. What else? uh base layers did you guys answer base layer stuff i'm sure i just answered a basic okay. i just said dress according to the conditions and wear something warm underneath if it's cold yeah you know i um i have big thighs and a big butt and i'll tell you in my waders sometimes it doesn't look so good so i would always try to wear like smaller thinner little tights or whatever you know and 
I now realize that the more layers I put on my bottom, you know, if I do a base layer and then I'll do a mid layer and, and whatnot, if I can be really warm on my legs and my butt, then my whole body is warmer. So just remember, like, this is not a fashion statement. This is like safety. You want to be warm. You want to be comfortable. And, um, so just wear a little, you know, I just wear a belt or something for my little fashion that I want to, but I want my legs to be warm. So I'm um, thinking about base layers. And again, if you're a hiker, if you're a skier, a snowshoer, mountain biker, you know, I, or runner, like I use all of my clothing for all, mold, all of my sports. So I can kind of think about, okay, well, what am I going to wear when I'm skiing? Right. Um, and if I'm walking and I'm wade fishing, I might be warmer because I'm walking, but if I'm in a boat, I definitely want to wear a lot more layers. So I might do a base layer and then I might have my insulated, you know, two to three puppies sometimes or a vest. Plus I always wear my outer layer with my Gore-Tex shell or whatnot, just to prevent wind, but also um, just to keep me warmer. So, um, and there's so many different layering. I'm sure she, I'm sure you guys have a ton of like information about that on the website or within the groups. Um, you know, I want to fly, we've done, we did a full thing on winter uh, layering. Um, so we have several blogs on that as well. But the other thing too, is knowing that layers can be expensive, right? Just anything in the outdoors can be expensive. So looking at secondhand stores or, you know, kind of looking at all of those other options as well. Um, um, just, you know, depend on your budget also. And we did uh, the 12 days of Christmas and we did 12 tips for how to keep yourself warm. And one of them definitely is nutrition. So make sure you're eating correctly, you're eating protein, you're eating fats, right? Cause you need all of that fuel in order to break down. Um, and the other thing too, so there's this superstition with fishing and bananas. So I don't know if anyone's heard like no bananas on the boat, all this stuff. Well, actually bananas help with all of your chills. Um, so bananas are good. And so I, I always say fear, no fruit, like when I'm fishing or whatnot, you know, so eat, make sure you really hydrate and you eat well, and that'll also keep you warm. So, yeah. Um, so here's, so Susan saying, I'm sure you guys already answered this. I'm a total beginner. Do I need to for this? I was late to the call, but in North Bend, Washington. Oh, hey, Susan. Um, I will say, what's there's a lake. My husband, we actually, I actually own a house in North Bend, Washington. Um, so great fishing at the lake right there. And the North Fork of the Snoqualmie is really good fishing also. So those that live in that area. Um, as far as beginner, um, you know, connect, there's, there's like five women's groups in the Seattle area. So first and foremost, you can connect with different women. You might need, um, you're probably eventually, if you want to, you could borrow some gear, you could rent some gear. Um, and then if you see that you like it, you could buy an inexpensive combo kit. Um, those combo kits can run anywhere from like a hundred dollars up to like you know, on average, like a basic kick would be 100 to 250. And that includes your rod, your reel, your fly line, your leader. Um, do know that as with most things in COVID, um, the, the demand is much higher right now than the supply. So you might have to wait a little while to um, get a rod and a reel because people are buying them. Um, but you can look at different, uh, go to your local fly shops or whatnot. And a casting lesson would be great, but what I would say is connect with the women's, like a women's group or connect with the community and just get out there and kind of meet with them and, and kind of go from there. That's, especially if you live in North Bend, there's a lot of uh, great women in that area for sure. Um, yeah, what else? Another, a question came up in the um, Q&A earlier and I was wondering if anyone else had some answers for this about uh, secondhand gear, like where to find it. Um, I have some ideas, but I just wanted to see if there was anybody yeah. else or anything else we should share. Uh, obviously Craigslist, right? eBay is a great choice. Make sure that they have photos and maybe even a video, um, really talk to them about it, ask them about scratches, about the warranty. Um, but you know, like Facebook marketplace, there's a ton of different, um, 
uh, different groups within Facebook. Actually, you know, fly has a like used gear little marketplace where you can just sell and or buy. Um, so yeah, kind of looking really a lot of people get them off of Craigslist and also eBay, but also Facebook marketplace seems to be a really good spot, a really good thing. What I would do though, is if you see something, I would take the description and research it, you know, and see what, what is the actual price first and foremost to make sure that you're not spending more than what it's worth. Um, but then also kind of make sure, look and see what the manufacturer uh, information is um, and ask for pictures. Like, is it scratched? Are the, you know, is the rod in good condition? Um, really talk to them about it before and also reach out to others that you might know, like, you know, the, within the community now, now we're all a community of women. So reach out and ask the questions too. And then, um, you know, I know that we as the community can definitely help. Um, what about you, Brooke? Do you have other suggestions? Um, I answered this in the, the Q and A, but I would look at there's Washington fly fishing forum mm -hmm. website. You can yeah. make an account and then look at the classifieds. Um, and then I actually got my first rod and reel setup from casting for recovery oh, awesome. they have um donated gear sometimes that they will sell secondhand for donations cool. um at a like really approachable price and it's just it's by donation so you can give as much as you want or much as, as much as you can um so if I'm, I'm not sure if they're still doing that but it was it's a great way to get started and donate to a good cause at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. For those that don't know, Casting for Recovery is uh, kind of teaching women who are survivors of breast cancer or survivors and or that have currently have breast cancer um, and teaching them how to um, heal through fly fishing. So it's a really amazing organization. Um, yeah. So that's, thank you, Brooke. That's a really good suggestion. And sometimes the fly shops too. I know like in Spokane, we do a garage sale. So the fly shop, a lot of times people will bring in their gear and then um, to get new stuff. And so the fly shop has a bunch of used stuff. So we've done a garage sale like four or five, the last four or five years. So that's another great way to, um, to get it as well, to get some gear. Yeah. What else? There's a really great question in the Q&A from our friend Teal of best ways to support female-owned fly shops, our fly fishing businesses. Is there a resource, are there resources where we can find those um, women-owned businesses? Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. So yes, go to unitewomenofly.com or uwotf.com, click on resources and any woman that has put themselves or has listed themselves on our website that is either woman owned and or women co-owned um, will be listed on the website. So it, we have their logo and then you click on it, it takes you directly to their website. Um, it also says like what state they're in. Um, there's also a few different maps that let's say you wanna hire a woman guide. So you can click on it, you can search it by state and or you can just look at their pictures and see who you might you know connect with or click with. Um, and then we also have a state map and also a portion that has industry women. So let's say you wanna connect with somebody that um, does photography or that teaches or that you know does casting lessons or whatever it might be, so you can do that. And then we also have a part where um, it's apparel. So any of the women specific like fly fishing apparel companies will be listed in that specific area. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of resources. It's just on, the, you just click on resources and there's a whole slew of things. Um, and you can, cause it is cool to support local and, and to support women owned. Um, and there's also a, a portion for jewelry or art. So you can go, there's a lot of really incredible women that are making just beautiful art as well. So that can also, um, you just click on it and it, it's all there. So, and again, know that the only people that list themselves with us are listed. So, um, but the list is pretty long. I mean, we probably have over 200, you know, owned, you know, women owned businesses that are listed. So yeah, great question. Awesome. Uh, anything else? What else in the Q and A? One just came in from Lisa. 
what makes a river easier or harder to fish? I have no idea if I'm fishing black diamond equivalents. Does it even matter? <laughs> Mostly I go with if it's pretty, if it's pretty and I'm happy. Well, first and foremost, that's awesome. I love to hear that. Like that's the way it should be. If it's pretty and you're happy, that's amazing. Um, what makes it black diamond or not? That's a great question. Um, you know, really what you're looking for when you're fishing is kind of a walking pace speed. Okay. So like if I'm getting up and I'm walking, right. Doing my walk, walking around. So like, uh, you don't want water that's super fast, right? Because bugs, the reality is if you think about humans, like we're not going to be, we can only sustain exercise for too long. So if it's really fast water, those fish aren't going to be able to sustain that or hold in that really fast water. Um, or not all fish. How's that? The average fish is not going to. There's always exceptions to the rule. Um, so you're looking for like a walking pace speed. Um, you're looking for, you know, sometimes depth can, can, uh, can matter, but, um, and it really truly depends on the time of year. Like in the winter time, fish, you know, like us, we're a little bit more lethargic. We're on the couch, you know, we, uh, we're not, we don't move as much per se. So in the winter time, fish are the same way. They're going to be in deeper water. They're much more lethargic. They're more sleepy, right? Whereas in the summertime, we start to, we were moving, we're running, we're doing, you know, kind of becoming more active and the same with fish. So they'll start to move into more shallow water, kind of uh, riffly water, which would be like kind of um, faster, but not as fast as real, like fast, fast rapids. Um, they're starting to move into some transitional water. And what that means is if you're looking at a river and you see a color change where it goes from like dark to light, um, you know that there's some sort of a depth change, right? Depth of water. So those fish will really hold a lot of times on those transitional lines. Um, so truly thinking, there's actually different sections of, of water, like of a run. Um, and if you were to Google it, you could find it, you know, you could look that up, but really looking kind of in the, the run section with the riffles is going to be the most efficient for trout per se in the river. Um, yeah. So hopefully that answered. I think there's a great website called fix.com, fix.com, and I'll send everybody the, the link, but they have a really great fly fishing section and it's all it's all like graphic drawn stuff but they actually their part that's the sections of the river is amazing so it talks about all of the definitions of like certain portions of a river they it's like a section and you always have like a riffle you have a run you have a pool you have a tail out you might have an eddy so most pieces of water always have these specific um, types or specific sections of it. And so learning that and learning where those fish might lie, are they going to be behind a rock or in front of a rock? Are they going to be protection? So under a log, you know, in deeper water, under foam or riffly water, you know, for protection uh, so that protects them away from birds. So learning that part of it um, and go to fix.com and look and just Google or fix.com, go search for fly fishing and you're going to get a ton of really good free information. So I, I love fix.com and it's great for if fixing your house or like doing all kinds of other stuff too. It's a really, really good resource. Um, but the sec, the river sections, that's the one that I'd recommend to anybody when you're learning about the sections of the river. So, yeah. I've never heard it referred to as a black diamond. I really like that analogy. I'll have to continue that that uh, talk. Cool. Anything else? Oh, here we go. Stacy just saying, yeah, the chick, the fish and chicks club. That's a great. So uh, if you're in like a college town and or, you know, in college, um, look to see there might be a fishing uh, club or fishing group within the college. Um, I know with Trout Unlimited, they have a, um, it's called Five Rivers, and they actually are start fly fishing clubs within, uh, within colleges. So that's what they specifically do based on conservation and fly fishing. So it's really cool. So um, yeah. What else? Anything else? Uh, 
I think you have successfully answered questions wow. and presented all the information. <laughs> awesome. So much information. And this is just the beginning of the journey, right? Like it's just, and then, you know, we're all still learning. Like Sue, Sue's been fishing for a long, Sue, how long have you been fishing for? Well, I grew up with a, a large spinning rod in my hand growing up on Cape Cod and Rhode Island beaches for big stripers, but I started fly fishing about Mm, 22 23 years ago and you're still you probably still learn every day right you're out yeah that's why I love teaching because I learn from beginning students I learn from other instructors I learn from the great women in the group United Women on the Fly yourself the other the other people in the group the thousands of women out there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. every time I go out I learn something absolutely for sure always or you learn you look and there's like a different, the fish is going to eat a fly differently, right? So one day mm -hmm. it might be on this perfect dead drift. And then the next day it only wants it like skittered around. So yeah. it, just every day is so different. It's like the days in the hospital for me. I know every day is going to be different. Just like every day on the river is different. And I think that's what keeps us going and mm -hmm. learning and just doing it. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I don't want to admit to a bunch of beginners online, but I break all the rules and sometimes still catch fish. So you can do everything the way you're supposed to and not catch fish and then divert from the norm and throw a big fat gaudy fly on there that doesn't look like anything and yeah. catch the fish of your dreams. So I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, they say well-behaved women rarely make history. So I mean, exactly. why play by the rules, you know? So, <laughs> and that's another thing too, is there are no rules in fly fishing. There are regulations, but there are no rules. So, you know, like as far as, um, you know, fish the way you want, experiment and have fun and dance and wear makeup and wear what, I, like just be you and have a good time and just really enjoy where you're at. And, you know, if it's, if it's beautiful, a beautiful place and you're happy, oh man, that's pretty incredible. Like, yeah, we're so blessed to, to be, privilege to do that so yeah cool awesome all right anything else any last final words christy i'll send you the or i think i sent you the link but i can resend it and i'll send you a list of all of the links that way if you want to send it out in the follow-up oh yeah we'll be sending yeah. out all the links cool. the recordings uh follow-up events on both parts with united women on the fly and she jumps all the things <laughs> we come in your way in that email. <laughs> and for those that are still on, this won't be the last collaboration, right? Like this is, it's so cool to have two like-minded women organizations that, you know, we, yeah, it's just, it's super cool. It's, we're outdoors and just want to be inclusive and, and play and be safe and, and be competent by ourselves, be independent, you know, confident and competent is really a cool thing to have when you're outside. So, yeah. Very cool. I'm seeing a lot of comments about being inspired. Many thanks awesome. to everyone. Thank you, Heather, so much. Oh, and our panelists for answering all yes. of the questions. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> much appreciated. Thank you all. So. Very cool. And if you, I mean, I know you guys loved it. You can watch it again when the recording comes your way. <laughs> <laughs> watch awesome. it in a year. That's what you should do. Because then you'll be, you'll take different things from it, you know, depending on whatever level you're at. So. Very awesome. cool. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. All right. Bye, you guys. Thank you.